We are here at the home of Larry Hama. Let's see if he's home. Hey, hey. hey. Hi. How are you doing, Larry? Okay, how are you doing, Carson? Thank you so much for having us. Where are we situated in Manhattan right now? Well, we're basically uh, three blocks north of the World Trade Center. And that's, uh, that's the tower up there. I think you have the best view in Manhattan. My spot on 23rd and 1st was nothing like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a pretty nice view when you're at night when everything's lit up. Nobody in Manhattan has, uh, has shades or blinds anymore. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, so whose library is this? Is this yours or your wife's? Uh, some of this is my wife's. Mm -hmm. um, this is just sort of overflow. And uh, my obsolete DVDs. <laughs> I still like having physical copies. Yeah, I like it. I like it too. So where do you do all your work? Upstairs. I'll show you. This building was originally five loft buildings that were um, joined together to form the uh, the New York City Unemployment Office <laughs> before they turned it residential. Some of the buildings were five stories and some were six, so they had to build this fake facade over the five-story buildings to make it all match up. And they built this little, very narrow room here behind the, uh, the facade. Yeah. There's a little catwalk here and, and a shelf system. This is my, basically my library and part of my unbuilt model kit collection. So uh, Kirk is a model builder as well, did oh, yeah. you know that? Yeah. Yeah, this is where I do all my work. How many years have you been in this office? Uh, 27 years. There's not a traditional kind of bullpen anymore anyway, is there? I mean, there's so many remote workers and overseas workers and... Well, the bullpen, you know, even when I was at Marvel in DC, the bullpen was basically, um, you know, just the, the paste up and mechanicals. You know, uh, oh, really? So yeah, wasn't... pretty much. Uh, uh, the, the guys that write it and draw it all did did, did the work at home. Okay. You know, there was a time, probably in in in, in the forties and fifties, where you know people actually came into the office and did it at the office. Uh, okay. I think you know, probably Jack Kirby and maybe some of those early guys, you know, actually did did come into the office and work. Yeah. Um, and there used to be sort of studios set up that did that. They weren't actually, the, the, you know, uh, various artists and groups of artists had studios together, you know, where they, uh, they just produced comics. It's just and, a creative and, house where you come in, you work yeah. with a bunch of other illustrators around you. Yeah, it was sort of like, you know, uh, jobbing out stuff, you know. Is that, and then if you have too much work, you can have other people help you, basically? Was that part of the benefit? Well, that was what continuity was like with Neil. You yeah. Know, that uh, he had this whole pool of guys there, and you know, when a big advertising job would come in, you know, he had uh, half a dozen guys that could sit there and uh, pencil the comps or storyboards or motion boards. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, once Neil inked them, it looked like Neil. Yeah. <laughs> so, really? Uh, yeah, you, you he, could overcome anatomy discrepancies and layouts. No, no. The, the thing was, you you had to be able to draw yeah. a uh, a realistic human figure, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, as long as it wasn't stylized, it was just straight, you know, uh, you know, normal proportions, yep. and everything. Then uh, uh, once Neil linked it. It it uh, it was Neil. So it's amazing. So he was he was the finisher on all things that had his name on it. Yeah. So. yeah well, he was the finisher on uh, on uh, the, mostly the advertising stuff. Mm -hmm. you, know. you know. When you say advertising, I, I don't think people tend to think of Neil Adams as a an advertising guy. They think of him as a comic guy. What kind of advertising work was he doing? Oh, that was like most of the work. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, he, we, we did stuff for Gray and uh, uh, all the big agencies. Yeah. Um, that had to be pretty lucrative compared to comics then. I would, it was I paid say. a lot better, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, that meant we were there 
12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, just cranking stuff out. And, yeah. uh, uh, but it was a great way to learn. I, w I would think at that age you were willing to put in the hours, right? How old were you yeah. at the time? Well, you know, I was in my 20s, you know, when I first started there, and we, you know, we, we worked around the clock, and it was just a chance to sit there and just draw, you know, all day, yeah. and draw with some of the best guys in the business, you right. know, and uh, so, because at that time, Neil was there, Dick Giordano was there, um, Russ Heath, uh, at, for a while, Sergio Aragonis had a table there. Yeah. Um, Jack Abel was there. Marshall Rogers. Um, uh, a, a huge amount of people passed through that that office, and there was also sort of like a, a meeting place for all the 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 young cartoonists and comic book guys because it was on Forty Eighth Street. Mm -hmm. Uh, between Fifth and uh, Madison, and uh, DC was like three or four blocks north, right. and Marvel was about five or six blocks north on Madison. Yeah. So if somebody was coming into like DC or Marvel, you know, and drop off pages, they could stop in, stop you. in, have a cup of coffee, and hang out and schmooze. You know, yeah. if you s sat in continuity for like you know six months you probably you got you, you just met everybody that was in the business pretty much do you uh do you have any spaces like that that you go to now where, where they're, they're, those don't exist anymore yeah. Yeah. i think it, it does exist to a degree that like uh artists have assistants but back then everybody had assistants and that's how you really sort of like an apprenticeship system right. you know, how you how you learn the ropes yeah. and how um technique and lore got passed down, you know. Yeah. I worked for Wally Wood and uh, he, he taught me how to letter because um, he said, look, if I, if I could teach you how to letter, I could teach you how to do everything else, you know, because then uh, lettering is, is just being able to control the tool, you know, and once you make, make the tool go like that, make the tool go like this, <laughs> and make the tool go like that, that's <laughs> Those are the three things you have to know. <laughs> so, so he figured lettering was like the m most precise step? Or? Well, yeah, and he also, he was, a, there was a letter named Gaspar Celadino. Mm -hmm. yeah, so he, and he was his favorite letterer. So he taught me the Gaspar Celadino letter, uh, lettering alphabet. And uh, that's what we taught everybody else, you know. That's how, how stuff gets, gets passed down, you know. I learned weird little tricks, you know, from from Woody that Woody had learned from Milton Kniff. <laughs> like how to do explosions, you know, and things. Uh, you know, if there was a way for, you know, uh, technique and lore and all this stuff to, to, to be passed on. You would think it would be easier with um, the digital age. Do you have uh, anybody that you would personally think of as an apprentice? Not really. No. I mean, but there are people that I've gotten into the business or, or, or helped or yeah. uh, gave their first jobs to or whatever, you know. The only reason I had a career in comics was that, you know, certain people held the door open for me, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Wally Wood helped me a lot. And when, Wally Wood moved to Connecticut. He fixed me up with um, Neil Adams. You know, Neil got me my first comics job. He told DC, look, if you give this kid a, an eight-page story uh, to pencil, I'll ink it. You know, that's how I got my first work. Yeah, you know? nice. People don't realize that, you know, that, that Neil got his foot in the door at, at DC very early, and he kept his foot in the door. <laughs> and uh, he was the guy that shoehorned in uh, Bernie Wrightson and Mike Kaluta and Jeff Jones when, you know, none of these guys had styles that were anything like the DC house styles. Right, right. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the, the editors that were there weren't very receptive to stuff that, that, that wasn't, that didn't look like what they were used to looking at. And, uh, he got them in the door, yeah. you know, he got 
uh, and Howie Shake and lots of guys, mm -hmm. you know, and me. Very and unique me. visual styles, those names. Yeah, and um, and he was the guy that um, really spearheaded the um, the campaign to get the Siegel and Schuster, um, you know, their due. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you've been in the industry for decades, and you've touched a lot more characters than just G.I. Joe, but what do you think will be your most prolific characters or, or most prolific creations? Impossible to predict. Yeah, really. You can't, you can't tell. Um, I mean, there's an awful lot of G.I. Joe stuff out there, but I also did Wolverine for eight years, you know, so, and at, at a time when it was also selling, you know, really big numbers. You never can tell. I mean, I, I went to a con in San Antonio about five years ago, and uh, the con people came and said to me, you know, uh, well, Robert Rodriguez wants to meet you. And I said, oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> I'll take that meeting. <laughs> and he comes by my table, and he, and he says, uh, I would like to uh, get a Dr. Death sketch from you. Okay. You know, and I said, well, why do you want a Dr. Death sketch? And he said, well, you know, when I was a kid, I got a copy of Bizarre Adventures with Dr. Death with Kip and Muffy in it. And that's what inspired me to make my first movie when I was 11 years old. I made a Dr. Death movie on Super 8 starring my kid brother wow. <laughs> as Dr. Death. So you don't know, this you know, you don't know what, you know, a lot of people that know my G.I. Joe Wolverine stuff have never heard of Dr. Death, you know, so um, I did, I wrote all the G.I. Joe stuff while I was an editor, you know, so I was doing nine to five, you know, and then uh, I would go, after five, I would go to my office and uh, crank more stuff out. The editors were always allowed to write for the same company. You just couldn't write for your own office. So if I was the editor, I couldn't be the editor of G.I. Joe and write it. Right. You know. uh, I was the editor of Crazy first, and then they gave me all the Conan properties, and then I, I eventually had pretty much every book that wasn't in the Marvel Universe. You couldn't write for yourself, because that was, that was what, how it had been before, you know, in, in the 70s, and it was widely abused. You were allowed to, like, commission inventory stories, you know, but people abused that. They would assign themselves the inventory story and just, like, build up this entire thing oh, wow. of uh, inventory stories. And, of course, in a self-contained universe, you know, uh, the characters are... And, and the continuity is constantly evolving. So, you know, even after a year, your inventory story is obsolete. So were there a lot of books that just never saw print? Oh, yeah. You had to, like, completely kill the, the story if it was, like, you know, uh, about, like, Peter Parker before he got married and then right. after he was married. Or it's got Gwen in it and then Gwen's yeah. dead. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. You couldn't, uh, so these things had a, a definite shelf life, yeah. you know. Um, so, so what kind of stuff are you working on today? Obviously, you're still writing G.I. Joe. We're about to hit 250. Yep. Got a brand new Snake Eyes in place. So there's I'm, a I'm working on number 249 right now. There you go. <laughs> and I know you've said this a million times, but do you have any idea how 250 is going to end? No. No spoilers, of course. But I have absolutely no idea. So you, it's literally page to page. Just literally page by page. Yeah. Figuring it out as it goes. It just, yeah. Does it feel like a uh, kind of out-of-body kind of experience when you're in the zone and you're writing, writing those pages? Yeah, because lots of times you just sit there and you just say, it's not, it's not happening, you know. Then I, then I got to go, like, have a cup of coffee and watch a DVD of a samurai movie or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. But, you know, that's why I, I like, I've been doing all these layouts for DC, and uh, I, I like that because I, I don't have to think as much, you know, I can, uh, somebody else does the thinking, you know, and I just, um, what I had to think about is how to draw this impossible scene that they asked for, right. <laughs> but that's, in a way, that's easier than coming up with the impossible scene. 
Yeah. Do you mind showing? Is it possible to show a couple pages? Well, if I don't tell you what it's for, I can show you. This is, a, this, is, this is what my layouts look like. That's the size I work at. And so how many of these uh, pages will you crank out in a day, typically? Well, I could do as many as 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes I can only do three or four. <laughs> and this particular writer gives me, you know, this is like a four panel page. Yeah. But, you know, typically, you know, <laughs> you know what, he, what he throws in are like, yeah, like nine panel pages, you know, it's all talking heads, you know? Yeah, that's a little more complex. Yeah. This is as tight as I get them, you know. Uh, I'm not drawing the page, I'm laying it out, right. you know. Uh, but the layout is, is you have to tell the story. So has this always been a step in the process since your days of comics in the 70s, 80s, 90s, the, the kind of layout artist, or uh, is this something that's newer that they're starting to use more widely? I used to do, do this stuff at Marvel, because I'm basically a storytelling. I'm not really a finished guy. You know? I sort of lose interest after I figured out how to tell the story. Well, a lot of this isn't even as much layouts as like defining what the storytelling is. You know, they, they can like take you know, one of these shots and like shoot it from the other angle or, you know, yeah, right. whatever, or, you know, as long as they make it better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Are you following up? That's, they, a, that's a great they, point. If they make it worse, then... Then we're going to have issues. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I used to write scripts like this. I know. Yeah, you know, and uh, they weren't meant to be layouts. They, I, I just said, look, this is just to, this is just to show what's happening. If you want to shoot it from a completely different angle or, you know, whatever, you know, you're the artist. But 99% of the time, they just inked my scripts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like, mean, oh. I, I did one for Carmine Infantino for Star Wars. There was an entire script that was drawn. And I told Carmine, you know, this is, I'm not dictating you how to draw this. It's easier for me to draw a picture than it is for me to describe, use words to describe the scene, especially if it's, if it's complicated. And uh, he said, oh, sure, I understand. Then he went ahead and just... <laughs> drew what you drew. <laughs> some people said it looked like he just inked, inked the script, you know? <laughs> In some cases, you know, I never even got credit for that, you know? I mean, um, I wrote a bunch of daredevils that were, were inked by Klaus. Mm -hmm. Pretty much just followed my my uh, yeah. my layouts, and I didn't mind. I didn't. I didn't have a word processor at the time. That was the only way I knew how to draw, do scripts. So you're gonna draw it. Yeah. <laughs> it explains how I, I write a story. You know, I don't conceive the story in, in, in words. I see the whole thing as a series of, of, of pictures. And when I have to like write a plot or a script, um, I'm just describing the, uh, the storyboard I see in my head. You also draw up these kind of environments, these worlds that these scenes take place in for the artist to use as reference so they can make sense of how things are supposed to move around through these environments. Do you do that for you know books like DC or is that is that just for kind of these re recurring central locations like the pit, right? It's, if it's a complicated series of, uh, of actions around a, a specific location, you know, when I did uh, the Call of Duty right. books, I, I, I did that a lot. I would make a, a diagram of like a whole compound and say, well, this is where the tower is and this is where the vehicle park is. And, and here's where, you know, like three blocks away, this is where the sniper is on the roof. and so that you know the the artist you know knows where everything is in relationship to each other so you're not uh i I've, I've always hated that in comics where like you know the the background is obviously just you know a lamp thrown in to fill up the space where there isn't a figure yep. you know yep. when i'm writing even if i don't give the artist a diagram i i make a little diagram saying oh this is where the desk is and this is where the window is so, so you do lay out small spaces like offices and stuff too then well you have to i think okay. or else you lose track you know and then yeah. you, you know i used to like take the figures you know and you know make a little diagram and say okay living room and, and like put 
the figures that are in the living room there and put the figure, you know. Uh, so it's it's graphically there, you know. You can't uh, you can't lose track. Uh, so there's some uh, lots of times writers, you know, like they're, they're writing, they forget who's in the room, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or they forget that this guy is like actually supposed to be standing there leading on the fireplace right. or whatever. Um, but if you've got you know um, a visual system set up, you can you can avoid that. You know, I'm a little bit OCD, so uh, I like to have I like to have explanations for all those things, and um, I like the stuff to make sense. You know, <laughs> I, I like and I like there to be consistency, and I think that a lot of my fans like that. We appreciate you know, it um, absolutely. You know that uh, they like that particular type of attention to detail. We do. I mean, it shows up in the writing. It shows up in the environments. Uh, every time you saw the pit, it was consistent. A lot of guys, like you were saying, would just draw whatever background elements they wanted to into that scene. And I think the fans can see that, like you were saying. We got a real sense of space in the places that you kept taking us. So did you learn that kind of environmental sketching? Was that something you saw somebody else practicing? Or where did that come from? I learned that from Wally Wood. He liked to have the sense of you know, and if you look at his stuff, it's, you know, it's it's, it's really there. You know, he, he, the stuff is very consistent. Right. You know, I had Bernie Krigstein for my high school illustration teacher, and he was he was very much like that also. Yeah, I remember going to art camp at SCAD, and they were just getting me to do loose gestural sketches the whole time, and it was just like my mind can't break out of it. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I do stuff like Three D Joe's because it's so order driven. You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, and it man, it just scratches like, like that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. By the way, that was like my proudest moment when you got that and took a picture of it. Just the fact that you enjoyed it enough to take a picture of yourself with it. I use it. You know, I mean, it's 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 right there. You know, I can yeah. just go right there, and it's uh, all the info is it's, it's all there in one place. You know. So you don't have the uh, ninety to ninety four up. You're not using those characters as much. No. <laughs> I don't blame you. They're all, they're all around the corner in a tube. Nice. Nice. <laughs> I oh, ran I out of wall space. Believe me, seeing, seeing this space, I totally understand. I appreciate that you have one of them up. <laughs> you know? You want to talk me through some of your favorite stuff in here? Just so people can get a sense for what's important to you, what's meaningful to you, that kind of thing. Or... Okay, this is um, a cover painting for a paperback uh, done by uh, Bob uh, Larkin, who's a really terrific uh, cover painter. And uh, this was for a series, uh, a paperback series about mercenaries. Right. And uh, the leader of the mercenaries was the guy in back of me over there, uh, yeah. who was Corbin Berenson. Yeah. And this was right before he got his cast in um, L.A. Law. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I see your, uh, your Bucky O'Hare stuff is up there. Could yeah, that was never printed because it was a double page spread mm -hmm. and somehow we decided that it had to be reduced to a single page. So he just redrew it completely as a single page. Who was the illustrator on that one? That's Michael Golden. Okay. He's yeah. uh, pretty amazing. Michael Golden did those two over there also. I think one was a subscription ad and the other one was just a spot ad in Savage Tales. Uh, who's the sword drawing guy right there? Oh, that's me and Ralph Reese. We did a bunch of posters for um, an art house that did um, samurai movie festivals. We didn't get paid, we got free tickets. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, they're, they're, hopefully year round. Right? But there was like 30 movies that we all wanted to see. So, right. you know, okay. so you would have paid to see them anyway. Yeah, so okay. the poster, they said, well, you can, we got to keep the cost down so we can only have two colors. So I said, right. okay, black and red. And, and the blood splatter was red. And yeah. when we handed it in, they said, well, it's the only thing red is the blood spatter. I said, well, yeah. That's, it's going to work. Trust <laughs> it's gonna, me. It's going to work. <laughs> and they, they said it, it was not a successful poster because whenever they put it up, people stole it. <laughs> <laughs> you did too good, damn it. <laughs> That's pretty good when people want to own your stuff yeah, so bad. People it's... wanted the poster, right? Awesome. This is my diploma from the Wally Wood School of Comic Art. That's what I... And applied psychology. <laughs> right. <laughs> what qualified you for the psychology part? Was there some, uh, some just sitting there and listening to Woody uh, 
talk about his ex-wives. <laughs> <laughs> Woody took his, his actual own high school diploma and uh, doctored it up. And these are cigarette foil, foil from <laughs> cigarette packages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And th this was some sort of corporate seal that he found in the garbage on the street. And oh, he made wow. these up for um, all of his uh, ex-assistants one Christmas. He gave us all uh, diplomas. That's hilarious. This is handmade by Wally Wood out of meat erasers and, and uh, paper and glue. What? Gotta make sure I'm rolling on this. <laughs> Who's this character? Uh, it's a cute Wally Wood character. Oh man, that's beautiful. And of course, here's the, the Yoga Joes. Those yeah. Are, those are yeah. cute. Those are cute. My friend Mike Sullivan builds these and he makes these uh, erotic uh, robot movies. These erotic are, robot movies? Yeah, this is, they're all made from Barbies. What? Yeah. So he just cuts little pieces out of them and yeah, and he, he, had, he Oh, wow. And he, uh, I gotta get up he adds that. Sculpey to the heads. The details and are gorgeous. It's kind of reminiscent of those weird G.I. Joe figures, the Duke and Snake Eyes well, and Storm this. Shadow they just made. <laughs> what is going on back there? That's awesome. Well, it was a Guitar Man Plexi Strat. This one belo had belonged to John Cale and was used on uh, the Lou Reed uh, Blue Mask album. Wow. Uh, it's got a built-in preamp, yep. a little 9-volt battery. It weighs a ton, but it's got a really great sustain. They gave this to me, and I realized Stan's signature was just it's a stamp? printed. It was printed on there. Aww. <laughs> he, he couldn't even bother to sign it himself. So oh. I talked. I talked to Stan about it. He said, "Yeah, I'll you know bring it with you next time we see we see each other, and I'll <laughs> I'll sign it." <laughs> That's funny.